Welcome to another very exciting episode of Tubules Live. Today we are very privileged to have Dr. Chris Sproat with us. Dr. Sproat is a consultant oral surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas's since 2008. He qualified from dentistry in 1990 and medicine in 1997 with an intercalated BSc in physiology. He's a clinical lead of a very busy department at Guy's, which has close links with the head and neck department and regional oncology department at Guy's and St. Thomas's Foundation Trust. He has extensive experience with dealing with patients with osteonecrosis of the jaw, and he also um, has a specific interest in human disease in relation to dentistry. So, today's topic is bisphosphonates and bone anti-resorptive drugs, friend or foe. So without further ado, I'd now like to hand over the floor to Dr. Chris Sproat. Thank you, Rena, for that kind introduction. Good evening and welcome to Tubules Live. My name's Chris Sprout. I'm one of the consultant oral surgeons at Guy's Hospital. And what I'd like to talk to you tonight about is bisphosphonates and bone anti-resorptive drugs. Are they our friend or are they our foe? But before I start, I would like to show you where we work. This is our department, this is our hospital at Guy's that has been recently reclad thanks to the Qatari royal family, which means that it will, it will be still in existence till my, retire, till my retirement. Um, this is our department on floor 23, and this is the view from the window of our operating theatre as I'm contemplating whether bisphosphonates are really our friend or foe. What I'd like to do today is discuss a bit of basic bone physiology, explain the benefits of anti-resorptive drugs, and discuss the propo proposed mechanisms of jaw osteonecrosis, and cover risk assessment for dental surgery in these patients, and hopefully increase awareness of new drugs. The objectives are to increase knowledge of bone anti-resorptive drugs and their benefits, understand the proposed mechanisms of osteonecrosis of the jaw, and improve assessment of your patients. So let's start with a bit of basic bone physiology. When you first look at bone at the skeleton, it seems macroscopically static. But in reality, the skeleton is extremely dynamic. And believe it or not, the whole cancellous surface of your skeleton is replaced every two years. This occurs in a number of stages. There is an activation phase when osteoclasts are recruited uh, from the circulation. Um, osteoclasts then resorb the bone during the resorptive phase. Then there is a reversal as we move into bone deposition and the osteoblasts take over and form new bone. There is then a quiescent phase and the bone then um, goes into a, a, a stable state. This allows change in shape of the bones, it allows adaption to biomechanical forces and removal of, of micro uh, damage within the bone. This maintains the bone strength and also can be um, used to maintain mineral homeostasis. This remodeling process may be targeted or non-targeted, and this is under either local control in, in uh, degrees of targeted bone control or systemic regulation when it's non-targeted. Bone remodeling compartments form within the bone, and these are a specialized vascular structure that um, allows bone to be remodeled. The problem with these is they are also an ideal environment for bone metastases to seed. This shows a diagram of a bone uh, remodeling unit and what you can see here at the lead of the unit is the osteoclasts and they eat their way through the original bone and following behind are the osteoblasts which lay down new bone um, fill, filling up the hole created by the osteoclasts. This can be directed by the osteocytes within bone. So if there are microfractures in the bone, the osteoclasts will head towards these microfractures and automatically repair the area uh, with the osteoclast laying down new bone behind. This diagram gives a more schematic view uh, of the process, which is going on in you and I every minute of the day. What's special about the alveolar bone? Its function is to support teeth. It has an extremely high turnover rate. This is about five to ten times that of the tibia um, or the femur. It is also perforated by the teeth which it supports, which pass through the mucosa, um, connecting it to an extremely hostile environment um, which is full of microorganisms. 
This is also a highly vascular area of bone, with the maxilla being more vascular than the, than the mandible. If we talk a little bit about bone pathology, um, we'll all remember osteoporosis. This is where there is low bone mass and deterioration of bone quality. This affects all of us. In our junior years, um, we have um, an excess of, of laying down of new bone and, a, and a, minus, a small amount of resorption. As we become older, the, the bone resorption comes to dominate and this is when osteoporosis develops. This process, though, can be uh, increased um, by drugs like steroids and lack of activity. The problem with osteoporosis is it leads to fragility of the bone and susceptibility to fractures and approximately two, women, two million UK women currently have osteoporosis and there are over 18,000 osteoporotic fractures per year. Many of these fractures are a pre-terminal event with 25% of patients who have um, a hip fracture, for example, um, failing to recover from this injury. This diagram gives a schematic of what um, osteoporotic bone looks like and as you can see compared to normal bone there is decreased density um, of the bone structure which makes the bone much weaker um, than in the normal situation. One in ten women with osteoporosis will suffer a skeletal event um, and as I said earlier this may well lead to death. Um, Bone anti-resorptive treatments with bisphosphonates and other anti-resorptive drugs uh, slow down this process and can present, prevent approximately 50% of these um, skeletal events occurring. However, long-term use of anti-resorptive drugs will make the bone become more brittle and there is increasing evidence that overuse of these drugs may actually lead to fractures um, as the bones are not able to stand the sudden impacts. And there is new thinking that bisphosphonates may only need to be used for approximately five years of duration um, as they have an extremely long half-life. The other main problem um, that we suffer within the bone are bone metastases from solid tumours, for example, um, prostate and breast, and also tumours directly within the bone, for example, myeloma. 80% of these metastases come from uh, breast and prostate primary tumours, um, and once patients have um, bony metastases, their five-year survival in case of prostate goes from 56 to 3%. So these bone metastases have a very dramatic effect. And in terms of breast cancer, once a patient has bony metastases, they're only expected to live for a further two years. Bone metastases weaken the bone and they cause pathological fractures. And the diagram shows a fracture of, uh, of a bone clearly with a pathological fracture in, in the shaft. Um, spinal cord compression also occurs as the vertebral bodies are affected and collapse. This can lead to pain uh, and disability and also hypercalcemia um, as the calcium is released into the circulation uh, raising the calcium level significantly. This diagram shows um, a, a bony metastasis um, and what this will do is activate the osteoblasts, which in turn will then activate the osteoclasts. The osteoclasts will then resorb the bone and they will release um, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor and platelet-derived de growth factors, which then stimulates the tumour. The tumour then, in case of breast, for example, will release a parathormone-like hormone, which will then stimulate the osteoclasts. So you get into a vicious circle of the um, tumour growing further stimulating the osteoclast, which further resorbs the bone, which enlarges the tumour. And it's this cycle that needs to be broken uh, to prevent these um, metastases from getting larger. The therapeutic benefit of um, bisphosphonates and anti-resorptive drugs in this circumstance is to obviously limit the size of these uh, metastatic deposits, but this reduces bone pain, which is a significant problem for these patients, and also delays skeletal events. This is also going to improve the patient's quality of life and reduce the hypercalcemia um, as the calcium would normally be released into the circulation. This may also improve survival um, in some cases. 
Bone metastases require, though, high doses of um, anti-resorptive drugs and bisphosphonates, normally delivered via an intravenous route, and this, due, this is often given for the rest of the life of the patient. If we talk briefly now about osteonecrosis, um, what is osteonecrosis? This is avascular necrosis of the bone, um, most commonly affecting hips, knees and shoulders, and most commonly due to trauma, steroids and excess alcohol, and less commonly due to sickle cell disease, radiation, the bends, which is the problem that divers get with nitrogen bubbles within the bone, and finally bisphosphonates, which as you can see is actually a relatively minor cause overall of osteonecrosis, although a major cause of osteonecrosis in the jaws. If we move on to the jaw, um, jaw osteonecrosis is defined as the presence of exposed bone in the mouth which fails to heal after an appropriate um, intervention over a period of eight weeks. And there must have been either current or previous treatment either with a bisphosphonate or a bone anti-resorptive drug. There has got to be no history of radiation to the jaw. The reason for this is that um, radiation to the jaw will often cause osteoradionecrosis, which then may well be um, confused with that due to the bisphosphonates. I have changed this definition slightly as this was written by the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons and it was related directly to bisphosphonates and I've changed it slightly so we can include the newer anti-resorptive drugs. Uh, which I'll talk about later. Osteonecrosis is not a, a new problem. This was first noted in the 18th and 19th century and it occurred in match factory um, uh, fa where lucifer matches were made. These were the strike anywhere matches made out of white phosphorus. And the, the workers um, who used to stand around these vats of white phosphorus could develop this problem that was called fuzzy jaw. And this resembles very closely um, jaw osteonecrosis seen nowadays with bisphosphonates. And this occurred mainly around periodontally involved teeth, which may give us a clue that there is an etiology um, or part of the etiology of osteonecrosis is to do with bacterial infection. This shows a typical area of osteonecrosis in a jaw. As you can see, there is exposed bone and the surrounding mucosa in this case looks relatively normal. Believe it or not, many patients don't even realise they've got this. And we've seen lots of patients who've come to us and just said they can feel a rough area in their mouth and nothing else. And I think these lesions quite often are missed um, definitely by uh, non-dental professionals and also by dentists because they do occur sometimes in areas that aren't easy to see, for example, down in the lingual sulcus. Why is the jaw affected? Well, there is a very high turnover, as I mentioned earlier, which is five times that of the tibia, and it may be that that high turnover of bone accumulates more bisphosphonate uh, within it. Also, that high turnover is probably due to either evolution or design required for the ongoing function of the jaw. And if that turnover is reduced due to a bisphosphonate, this obviously has a detrimental effect um, in the jaw structure. There is frequent microtrauma within the jaw, and this is due to the teeth. Every time we eat, the teeth flex, the jaw fractures, and those bone-forming units will then go and seek out those fractures and repair them. If they are inhibited, it is likely that the, um, the, the microfractures will accumulate and actually then start to cause um, a degradation of the bone uh, within the jaw. Added to this, there is ingress of infection via the periodontal ligament round the teeth, which then probably um, makes it harder for the area to heal. The thin mucosal coverage as well um, also maybe leads to more problems as this doesn't want to, doesn't, is not able to heal over the exposed bone once this occurs. And the huge bacterial load also uh, creates a biofilm. What other causes are there of osteonecrosis of the jaw? Many of these are spontaneous. We recently had a patient um, who uh, developed a large area of osteonecrosis in the